heavy load Build a way beneath the ground Ain't no grave gonna hold me down Oh my Lord, I can barely see Waiting for your reckoning Angels humming, can you hear the sound? Ain't no grave gonna hold me down
God we meet. I followed God like a child. Hey! 
before John sings that again, let that settle in your spirit. How wonderful that sound is. How wonderful that name is. That the Lord has given us something that we can echo back to Him today. That's going to be pleasing in His sight. That's going to establish a throne for Him to inhabit this morning. So if you're here, if you're joining us by webcast, begin to let that sound, that wonderful sound that He created in you, begin to let that sound arise in you. That this will be a day that that sound arises. It begins to pierce the heavens. That heaven and earth will be in agreement with the sound of adoration, of worship, of praise, of honor of the one who's worthy of that wonderful sound. His grace, His covenant, His blood Attends me in the well. I want to sing that again. His grace, His grace, His covenant, His blood. Attends me in the whelming flood. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the Son. be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, oh, you will be praised, you will be praised. This will be a week that I will release a new seeking draw upon your life. You will begin to seek me and long for me. You'll say, I must have intervention. I must have a breaking in of God's presence in his life. I say, I'm going to draw you and you will seek me in a way and you will know me in a way you haven't known me. So I say, feel the drawing, submit to the drawing and watch the seeking begin. And I will begin to draw you into that which you are longing to experience. Nothing. Oh, how he loves us, Lord. How he loves us. How he loves us all. But you are worthy of it all. Oh, I'm seeking you in a new way, Lord God. 
This is the week in which I'm beginning to brood and form in a new way. For there's things that I have longed to see come into the earth realm. And even as my people gather and loose the sound, this is a week that I am hovering, that I am hovering, that I am hovering, that I'm calling my people into a new place of alignment. For even as my army begins to assemble, a new sound of joy, a new sound of laughter, a new demonstration of power is beginning to arise. So he said, allow my spirit to brood over you, because as I begin to meet with you, you will begin to see the two ends that could not come together, you will see them meet in this week. And know this day that your praise and worship are rising as an occupying force in the spirit realm. Know this day that there is a route taking place in the realm of the spirit. And as you meet with me this week, that will only increase. There is a displacement coming in the second half the worship and praise of my people as they seek me, as they seek my spirit and respond to all that I am offering them. And I say I've been rearranging your confusion. For you have not been able to see the joy in the midst of the chaos around you. I say this will be a time that I draw out the joy that is in you. For I place you in that chaos to produce joy. I say to you, the chaos will subside and you will see the order if you will release the joy that I have put in. You. Yes, I see the joy in the chaos around me. The Lord said it's not how eloquent you pray, it's not how long you do it. This week he showed that it was the one word, the one effective thing that you needed to speak into a situation that my family and I went through. But when we went in there, it was the one word he spoke that morning in peace that sustained us through the midst of chaos. He said, not let not the downdraft or the down pull you down into the circumstances but be buoyant on that one word and it's breakthrough in this season declare breakthrough after breakthrough after breakthrough and everything that seems chaotic in this season because God is saying there's a place that I'm calling to you to by which you're buoyant and you ride just as it is you don't stop at one breakthrough but it's breakthrough beyond breakthrough beyond breakthrough and now you will see the hand of the most high God in all those names that we studied in a past season all displaying his characteristic coming to a fullness with the angelic armies, the angelic force now pushing you through and every other force has got to bow now in the name of Jesus and by the blood of Jesus it's not the mere words that you speak but it's the one effective one that causes a bullseye shot in every season in Jesus name yeah, 
our Father. Oh, our Father. All of heaven roars your name. Sing louder. Let this place erupt in praise. Can you hear it? The sound of heaven touching earth. The sound of heaven touching earth. Our The sound of heaven touching earth, the sound of heaven touching earth. Oh, our Father, all of heaven roars your name, sing louder. Let this place be built in praise, can you hear him? The sound of heaven touching earth, the sound of heaven touching earth. You are Bless you. Bless you. Amen. Thank you, Judah. Well, we're excited about this week. Before we uh, leave this, we want to send a few people out this morning. I want Judy Rectorfig to come forward, and Elaine Priestley, Cindy Lou Fancher, and Jam Alexa Matthias. If you could please come forward. They're all going into something new, and you heard Chuck's prophetic word and the move of the Spirit today, that there's interventions, there's changes, there's new patterns, and each of these are going into something new. Judy is going to see family in Georgia as well as attending the gathering of the clans. Elaine Priestley is going to be going to Humble, Texas. Humble, Texas for a women's conference. She's going to be loosing the word of the Lord. We've got Cindy Lou who's going to Belize, who's going to work with Christian schools and an orphanage there. And I love this. Jam Alexa Matthias, it is her first day. Look at her. I want to make sure the camera gets her. Look at her today. It's her first day as director of a port authority at DFW. So I want you to extend your hands to all these people. Extend your hands to him. Father, we thank you for the new paths, for the interventions, for the new courses. And the Lord said, this is a week in which I'm going to begin to order your steps in unusual ways. For some of you would feel like you think you're going to trip and you're going to fall. And you say, Lord, this cadence that I'm trying to step into, that cadence is so unfamiliar. It seems so awkward. But the Lord says, even as you're willing to step in a new way and to move to a different beat, the Lord says that will be the sign that the angels are coming to align heaven and earth, that you're going to hear them even as they came in the mulberry trees marching 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 the Lord says when you feel that you're uncertain of your footing the Lord says that is the time to cry out for my angelic messengers will be dispatched and you will see women's conferences opening up and nations opening up and the port authority opening up and the gathering the clans opening up so he says let this be a day in which your steps are ordered and you welcome my angelic messengers to go with and before you in Jesus name amen Bless you all. Thank you. You may be seated. We're excited about this week. It is another developing week. We're moving through our 52 days to arise and build. And so right now we're in the focus of walking in His Spirit. If you haven't started that, it's not too late. If you haven't started the 52 days, it's not too late. We want you to get into this rhythm that the Lord has us to bring us into a new season of development and advance. So this week for our structure meetings, our corporate meetings, Tuesday morning we'll be back in the prayer tower at 6 a.m. for breaking of the day. Wednesday at noon we'll be in the prayer tower for the Triumphant Faith Institute. 
exhortation deliverance, and then Thursday at 6 o'clock back in the prayer tower for breakthrough prayer. So you're invited to join us for all those who are on the webcast. We'd love you, for you to be a part of that. So, But this morning, we're going to be continuing our series on the parables and the parables of the kingdom. So if you would join me in welcoming Robert Heidler, he'll be leading us forward with a new understanding of the treasures that await us. Thank you, Brian. Amen. Well, welcome to Triumphant Faith Institute. And we're right now in a series about the parables of the kingdom. Because God wants us to understand the kingdom. God did not call us to religion. He called us wow. to the kingdom. Now, before Robert gets started, he presented me with his first fruit, The Eye on a Stronghold. This book is coming, but actually this is a form of a parabolic understanding of spiritual warfare. So God is doing something in all of us to unlock the way we see things. He's repositioning us. He's expressing himself through us. He's getting us in new places. So today, just let him reveal something to you that you need to see. Amen. Amen. And I'm excited about that new book because what it's all about is this. God can take you through any hell that you have to pass through. He can bring you through hell. He can heal you of all of what you suffered. And there is redemption at the end. So let's go ahead and put the PowerPoint up because we want to learn about the kingdom this morning. So the message this morning is Parables of the Kingdom, Part 2, The Treasure and the Pearl, because God wants us to know the surpassing value of the kingdom. Matthew 13 is where Jesus gives a whole series of parables about the kingdom. And one of them is this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like the treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, he went out and sold all that he had and bought the field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything that he had and bought it. And then Jesus says to the disciples this. He says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you. You know, one of the primary themes in the Bible is the kingdom of God. The message of Jesus was the message of the kingdom. When Jesus came, he proclaimed, the kingdom is at hand. In John 3, Jesus said people need to be born again so that they can enter the kingdom. In Daniel 2, Daniel sees this huge statue that symbolizes all the kingdoms of mankind, but then a large rock strikes the statue and shatters it. And while Daniel watches the rock grows until it becomes a huge mountain that fills the earth. And then Daniel explains the symbolism of the mountain. He said the mountain is a kingdom set up by the God of heaven that will never be destroyed. It will endure forever. See, one day the kingdom of God will fill the earth. His kingdom will come. His will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in that day, the kingdom will be like a mighty mountain. No one can miss it. But right now, the kingdom is hidden. It's invisible. It's an incredible secret. So what is the kingdom? Well, first of all, the kingdom is God's goal for you. All right. When Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be, to be born again, it wasn't so that he could get himself a ticket to heaven. It was so that he could enter the kingdom. You see, God wants everyone to be born again. He wants everyone in heaven, but his highest goal for you it, right now is to enter the kingdom. Kingdom means rule. To be in the kingdom is to live under God's rule. 
at seeking to have God's will accomplished in every area. And where the kingdom of God is established, where the will of God is established, there the kingdom of God has come. So that's what Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And see, when God's will is done on earth just as it is in heaven, then God's kingdom has come. Now, right now, God's will is not being perfectly accomplished on the earth. The Bible teaches sickness is not God's will. Yet sometimes we get sick. Lack is not God's will. But sometimes we feel like we don't have enough. Sin is not God's will. But sometimes we fall into it. Now, if you want to see if God's will is being done... All you need to do is to read a newspaper. Because the newspaper message of the newspaper tells us Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. The evening news is just a report of the latest ways that Satan has oppressed the people of planet Earth. It's a story of sickness and oppression and poverty and sin. And so what's the problem? The problem is that we live in territory of a ruthless, rebellious tyrant named Satan. John, 1 John says the whole world is under the power of the evil one. And Satan wants to oppress the entire human race, and he does it through sin and through sickness and through lack and all of his other schemes. And so if you're experiencing sin and lack or sickness, what that means is that Satan has imposed his will in your life. So we live in enemy territory. Now the good news is that Jesus came to destroy the works of the evil one. When he found sin, he brought righteousness. When he saw lack, he released provision. When he found sickness, he healed it. And it's very interesting, when Jesus healed the sick, he announced, the kingdom of God has come among you. See, healing is just enforcing the will of God on planet Earth with regard to your health. It's bringing your body back into line with God's perfect will. And that's also the test Jesus assigned to his church. We're called to manifest God's kingdom right here in Satan's territory. We're called to be ambassadors of the kingdom. Our job is to tear down the works of the enemy and set his captives free. We're to bring sinners to salvation, healing to the sick, prosperity to the oppressed. To bring the earth back into line with God's will, that's the kingdom. God wants you to have a kingdom mentality. Let me say again, Jesus did not come to start a religion. He came to manifest the kingdom. Now let me say that one more time. Jesus didn't come to start a religion. He came to manifest the kingdom in the world. And that brings us to the parables of Jesus in Matthew 13. These are the parables of the kingdom. In 1311, Jesus says that in these parables, he is giving us the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. And these parables are given to change our way of thinking and give us a kingdom mentality. Now last week we looked at the parable of the sower. As the farmer sows his seed, it falls on different kinds of soil. The seed is always good seed, but some of the soil is bad soil, and the plants could not grow. Some, though, falls on good soil and bears much fruit. He's saying not everyone can receive the kingdom message. But for those who do, it changes everything. All right. Now this week we want to look at two more parables. First of all, the parable of the pearl merchant. In Matthew 13, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he finds one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had. And bought it. See, the pearl merchant was constantly on the lookout for pearls. Over the course of a year, he would have looked at many pearls, but bought very few. But then one day, he sees a perfect pearl. 
a pearl of such great value that he has to have it. And so he goes and he sells everything he owns so that he can buy that pearl of great value. He sells everything he owns and with joy he goes and he buys the pearl. Then there's the parable of the treasure hunter. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man find, found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. So here's a man who finds a fabulous treasure buried in a field, but it's not his field. He doesn't have the right to it. So what he does, he covers it back up, and he goes and he sells everything he owns. And it says he does it with joy. He joyfully gives up everything so that he can buy the field. And when he buys the field, the treasure is his. Now, in both of these parables, we see someone who found something so valuable that they gladly gave up everything they had to get it. And see, Jesus wants you to know that's the value of the kingdom. If you really see the value of the kingdom, you will lay down everything to obtain it. It's really important that we know that because there is a cost to the kingdom. Some people think the kingdom is easy. You just sign up with God, you pray this little prayer right here, and you begin getting regular downloads of blessing. You know, God is a good God, the devil's a bad devil. Trust in Jesus and he'll be your head butler. Let me tell you, that's not how the kingdom works. The kingdom is of great value, but it is costly. Entering the kingdom means giving up everything you have. It means you give up your life. You have to give up the old life to get the new one. You give up your old fears. You give up your old values. You give up your old ambitions. You give up your old sin to walk in purity because you have to reject the old to get the new. And that's not an easy thing to do. See, kingdom means rule. And to enter the kingdom means you are coming under his rule. In your old way of life, you were the king. You got to choose to do what you wanted to do. That's why you got in such a mess. But in the new way of life, he is the king. It means you lose control and you give control to him. And that really, in the process, feels like a kind of a death. It's what the Bible calls dying to self. It means you give up your right to direct your own life. And the New Testament gives us a very vivid picture of that. It's a picture that God established really as the starting point of the Christian life. It's a picture of baptism. Because, see, that's what baptism pictures. Going down into the waters of baptism is a picture of death and burial. When you go down into the water, you are testifying, I have died to my old life. And then coming up out of the water is a picture of resurrection to new life, kingdom life. And so when someone is baptized, if they really understand what they're doing, they're saying, I have died to my old life that I may gain the kingdom. Now, what makes the kingdom so valuable that someone would give up everything to gain it? I think the key is found in Matthew 6, 33. Jesus, in Matthew 6, describes all the things that the world seeks after. But then he gives a promise. He says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you. He said the kingdom is valuable because when you get the kingdom, you get it all. Oh. Tell your neighbor, all. Oh. Let's look at this verse more closely. He says he describes our need for provision. He says don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first the kingdom of God 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus says, don't worry about your needs. Seek the kingdom. There's full provision in the kingdom. Do you need deliverance? Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So if you're oppressed by the enemy, if you are depressed and filled with anxiety and fear, if you're unable to stop destructive behavior, you don't have to live under all that. Seek the kingdom. Because when the kingdom comes, you're free. Do you need healing? It's in the kingdom. Jesus said, whatever city you enter, heal those who are sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. So if you have sickness and infirmity, you don't have to keep it. Seek the kingdom. When the kingdom comes near to you, you'll be healed. Jesus said to get kingdom benefits, make it your highest priority in life to seek the kingdom. Because if you can get the kingdom, you have the answer to every need you could ever experience. But what does it mean to seek the kingdom? Some people think seeking the kingdom means getting all religious. Some people think seeking the kingdom means I'm going to quit my job and just sit around praying all the time. Let me tell you, that's not kingdom. That's religion. That's not even Christian religion. That is Greek paganism. It's like the monks who thought they could get close to God by escaping the world and living out in a cave somewhere. But a lot of people get deceived in that. I've had people tell me, you know, I think God told me I'm just supposed to quit my job and spend my time praying. And what I always tell them is this. Well, you, just, just so you know, that's also a call then to fast. Because God said if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, it's important to get along with God and pray, but that doesn't mean you try to escape the world. Kingdom is not escaping the world. Kingdom is changing the world. God doesn't call you to retreat from the world. He wants you to invade the world. Seeking the kingdom means engaging the world. You don't quit your job to manifest kingdom. You're, Ephesians says your job is part of God's will for you. God has positioned you there as an ambassador of the kingdom to change that place for him. It means God has positioned you in the world as an ambassador of the kingdom. And see, an ambassador manifests his home country wherever he goes. Back in the late 1980s, I went to Moscow, Russia for the first time. It was a dismal, dismal place. Everything was broken and fallen down and dirty and the food was bad and it's just not a pleasant place to be. But during our time there, we were invited to dinner at the American Embassy. A family lived there. And you know, we, we, went, we walked down the streets of Moscow into the gates of the embassy, filled out the forms, and went in. And legally, even though we were right in the middle of the city of Moscow, when we went through those doors, we were no longer in Russia. We were in America. That was American soil, and it looked like it. You walked around in there, all the buildings looked like you were in America. They had a little convenience store that sold all American food. Even the plumbing fixtures were American. Somebody going into the American embassy in Russia gets to get a picture of what America is. And see, that's what it means to be an ambassador. Kingdom means wherever you are, whatever you do, you, your purpose is to manifest the kingdom of God to those around you. So how do you seek the kingdom? Seeking the kingdom begins by knowing the king. It means to seek him. It means to know him because you can't represent the king as his ambassador till you know him well. So you need to learn to hear his voice. You need to learn to sense his presence. You learn his heart. You come to know his word. And then you submit your life to him. 
You die to yourself and allow him to be king in your life. You repent of going your own way. You let him set your goals and establish your steps. You submit to the authorities that God has established in your life. And then you live as an ambassador of the kingdom. You express the reality of the king in your neighborhood, on your job, wherever you go. You let your life demonstrate his faithfulness, his love and his compassion, his righteousness and his integrity, his diligence, his joy, his freedom, his power. And then you seek to establish God's will and God's purposes everywhere. Where you see the work of the enemy, you ask God, Lord, how do you want me to pull down what the enemy has done? It may be through prayer and intercession. It may be through a demonstration of God's love and his power. It may be through deliverance and healing, through a teaching, through a prophetic word. Now, see, it can be a frightening thing to seek the kingdom. Religion can be very comfortable and secure, but life in the kingdom is spelled R-I-S-K. That means if you are manifesting the kingdom of God, you are turning your back on the, what the world values. It means you are always living on the edge. It means you are always in transition. It means you are often uncomfortable. Your mind often won't understand. People will look at you and say, why is he so different? There's a cost to the kingdom. Mark 10, Jesus called a rich young ruler to follow him, and it was an incredible offer, a call, an offer to be one of Jesus' disciples, to be with him, to see the dead raised, to see the blind receiving their sight. But there was a price to pay. He had to give up his whole life. He would have to give up his trust in his money. He needed to learn that security was not found in his bank account. And the rich young man turned away because he was not willing to pay the price. But then there was another rich young ruler who did pay the price. And his name was Saul of Tarsus, and he later wrote in Philippians chapter 3, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. That's the man who found the treasure in the field. That is the pearl merchant who found the pearl of surpassing value. And see, to enter the kingdom, you must have the mentality of that pearl merchant and the treasure hunter. You must be willing to give it all to seek the kingdom. See, there's a cost to the kingdom, but it's not really a loss because Jesus gives an incredible promise. Jesus says when you have the kingdom, you have it all. In Luke 18, Jesus promised no one who has suffered loss for the sake of the kingdom. And by the way, he doesn't say if you suffer loss. He says when. He says you will suffer loss to get the kingdom. But he says no one who has suffered loss will fail to receive many times as much in this age and the age to come, eternal life. Let me tell you, it's not just pie in the sky by and by. Jesus, as you really get into the kingdom, you will see blessings in your life right now. In Mark 10, Jesus said you get a hundred times as much in the present age, whether homes or brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields. Because see, to have the kingdom is to have it all. If you really lay hold of the kingdom, if you really come under the rulership and direction of the king, the result is a life of full provision, freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, where you see the power of God manifested in healing and deliverance because the kingdom is the rule of God manifested in the earth. He wants to manifest his rule in your life. God wants you to know he really is good. And he really does love you. And he's calling you 
to seek first the kingdom because the kingdom of God is here. Let's thank God for the kingdom. And Lord, we come before you today and we acknowledge that you are the king. You have not called us to religion. You've called us to kingdom. Lord, I pray for greater and greater revelation to each one here, to each one on the web wow. of what it means to be in the kingdom of God. Let's clap our hands. Thank God for that. Now, how you get into the kingdom is through doing and obeying what the Lord tells you to do. You want to do Shabbat. See, by doing Shabbat, you're going to give up a portion of time. And you're going to enter into something you couldn't see. You want to celebrate first fruit. By doing that, you will start experiencing the kingdom. Now, between now and first fruit, the next three weeks... Starting next Sunday morning, we will do baptism. Some of you, you're, today is about pulling the blinders off so that you can see. So some of you, you will hear the Lord say, I want you to die again. I want you to die to some things that's clouding your vision and be raised into a clear vision. The next three weeks. Now, if you feel like you're called to be baptized, you can contact Susan at the front desk. Uh, or you can get in touch with one of us. The Lord will start opening your eyes to the kingdom that is not only in you, but how the kingdom is manifesting around you. Now, Father, we thank you that you're entering us into three weeks of seeing. Now, Father, we thank you and we bless you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be back in here around 9 o'clock. Go take a break. We'll see you then.